Yeah. Is everyone ready? No comedy. Okay. Uh, hello, and welcome to the third installment of this year's lecture series, In Experience Of. This week, we're joined by Ignacio, we'll be discussing scale and scope. So, thank you for coming, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hi, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you for organizing. Uh, Ruiz, Augustas, uh, Arjun, Sam, uh, Abdul, and University of Reading. Uh, my name is Ignacio, or Ignacio, as I like to pronounce it. A surname I won't even try. It's too complicated in this country. But uh, I run my own practice in London and uh, with my colleague Marlene. Uh, so it's a, it's a small office, um, but it's not always been the case. Uh, when preparing the lecture, I was discussing with Augustus uh, what was a suitable topic or, or what to talk about. And, um, and we thought uh, that, that this week it would be nice to give a, a big dose of reality when you get out of uni. Uh, what type of offices do you apply for work? Uh, if you, do, you, do you go to work for yourself on your own uh, straight away? Uh, big projects, small projects, big budgets, commercial, residential, options are endless and every one of you will pick your own route. Um, and they're all that nice. Architecture is a lovely profession, uh, but it's very varied. Um, so scale and scope, uh, I'll try to run uh, through those differences. So scales of projects, scales of teams, budgets, durations in time. This was um, uh, when I came to London, I worked for four years at Foster and Partners. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge office, and this is the biggest project I worked on. It's uh, Apple headquarters in Cupertino. Uh, it's fast. Uh, just to say some, uh, some figures. Uh, so the project started or, or it got commissioned in 2009, but it only opened in 2018. So that means you work in the same project or you can work in the same project for 10 years. Now, most people won't work in an office that long. So you join for a few uh, months or a few years. Depending on what stage that project is, that's where you're going. Uh, so you might see early competition stages, more advanced detail design, uh, maybe building supervision. Um, and then obviously the scale of the project, 16,000 people, um, 70 hectares, huge uh, facilities for gym, huge office, parking, theater. Depending on what area you work in, you will see some things, you will see cladding, you will see interiors. It depends uh, on how lucky you are because it's not that easy to apply for a specific place, a specific package a specific stage. You, you join the office and they, and they allocate resources as, as, it, as, it's, as it fits. Now, when you work on your own, that little red dot in the middle is one of our current projects. Uh, so the scale is hugely different. Now, that is, in this particular case, a house in the outskirts of Madrid. The red line outline is the plot, so it looks much bigger than because we picked so many neighbors but it's a house for one person, and it's 120 square meters. Is it better, is it worse to work on a big project or a small project? In all honesty, it's, it's the same. You get to design the same things. You get to design doors, you get to design windows, you get to design cladding, you get to design, but you do it at a different scale, do it with a different budget. Uh, but the project can be equally nice. And now in, in this case, that particular house uh, was following passive house standards, it had charred timber facade, it was clad in timber for sustainability reasons, we had uh, heat recovery pumps. It was a lovely project, or it is a lovely project to work in, it's still in progress. Um, now my route to architecture, how, how, how did it end up here? Uh, no one in my family is an architect. Uh, I happened to decide to be an architect very early in my life. Uh, I visited one of my friend's parents' office, and they were listening to the radio, they were doing models, they were paintings on the walls. I thought, I love it. And architecture, as you know, is a profession that everyone encourages you. You receive very positive feedback from everyone. Everyone would have loved to be an architect at some point in life, and then you end up being an architect. I studied in the Polytechnic School of Madrid. For the drawings that I see around, I, I, I suspect we receive more or less the same education. It's quite technical. I saw lovely drawings on the walls. Uh, uh, construction uh, details uh, and during my university I did a few internships in different offices. Now I encourage you all to do internship. You get to see or to balance or to have an understanding on what's going to happen after university. Um, I did work at KPF one summer. That was my second year. I think there are a few second years 
uh, students here. Um, I also work at a different Spanish uh, office that's called Bueso in Chausti Rain. It's difficult to read from the logo, but I uh, encourage you to Google them because they do fantastic high end uh, residential buildings mainly in Spain. That's Bueso in Chausti. And after university, I went to UCLA, uh, California, to do a, a master's in business and real estate. And after that, I applied for jobs. Uh, it was 2010, I was applying in the US, but sponsoring visas was not easy at the time. We were coming out of a crisis. UK was a, uh, another option, and I got hired by Foster and Partners. Fantastic. Uh, couldn't, be, couldn't be happier. And then after four years of working there, I decided to start my own practice, which is the next logo, the IL Architecture. Um, so because of uh, my career and my path for architecture, Augustus and I thought that it would be a good idea to, to give you a bit of an outline, to give you some perspective of what are the, the different things that you can, that you can do when you, when you finish your studies. Um, I like to start with this slide because that was my first project in uni. And uh, uh, as you can see, I didn't even know how to use uh, Photoshop or InDesign. Uh, the presentation was cutouts pasted on a paper, photocopied, handed to the teacher. Uh, it was the first project we, 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 we were asked to do. It was fold a piece of paper, now come up with a house. Um, and it was interesting. I was already doing stairs up walls. Uh, university projects are, 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 to, are to express or to, to encourage you to be as creative as possible. Um, to do the th type of things you don't do out of uni, because out of uni projects are more real, if you might. In university, I did media techs, I did houses in the moon, I did museums, I did spas. Uh, it's lovely. You can have all the, all the joy during your studies. Um, my final graduation project was a dance center in Manhattan. Uh, as it comes, you pick the best sites when, you, when, you, when you're in, in uni for your, for your project. So, so I was uh, Manhattan's uh, coast, that red pier, uh, just out of off the skyline, with some folded uh, slabs, creating indoors and outdoors uh, stages, overlooking Manhattan skyline, or the river, Hudson River. Um, now, as, as, you, as you know, you had to develop renders, plans, sections, uh, represent it, come up with a structural solution for, uh, for the folded metal sheets, the staging, the steps, uh, cross-section at the end, parking, so you get to design the project at the design level. But it's only design. It's only a project. It's what Jeff LeMay is here. He, he, he did a lecture last week. would define as the virtual. It's still not real. This one will never be real. And designing is fun. It's easy. But it's also lacking a lot of the process that takes for something from a design to be built. There are many stages that are still not there. You're still dreaming, you're still doing uh, as best design as, as, as you can. Um, uh, and it's good for what it is, uh, design. Now with that project I applied, with that project I got in, hired by Foster. Um, uh, there is a graduate show once a year when you join all the new staff members, join the office and you get to present your project and you meet Foster himself for 20 seconds and is the happiest day of your, <laughs> of your life so far. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a brilliant experience. And then you join an office. At the time we were 1,000 people. I think now they're close to 2,000. Many projects. Obviously, the good thing about joining a big office is that you have many friends. You meet many people. You, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like being in university again. Um, and, and, and you build relationships that they, they last long. Like, uh, and, and people, most architects that get hired by these offices are good, they're passionate, they like it. So they, they most likely go to different destinations, different offices. Recent projects I've collaborated with an ex foster and partner in Dubai. Uh, I was lucky, I got a project in Dubai. Do I know someone in Dubai? There was an ex foster working there. Uh, and so on. So, so you build good connections. Not only have good projects, uh, but, but, the, but the people is good. The people are nice and, and, uh, and I would definitely suggest to go through a big office at some point in life, preferably in the earlier stages because you learn, you're supervised, there's many levels above you, 
you learn um, as you're developing uh, different things of the project. And it's not as easy when you're on your own. There's always people that you learn during your career, there are consultants for everything, but a big office is, is, is helpful in that sense. Now, I, I, I landed in Bloomberg Project. I think uh, you've seen some images of this project. Um, now, I joined in 2010, and the project had just won the competition. So it might have started in 2009, and it only got completed in 2017. So again, it's almost 10 years from start to end. Um, it's, it's a long time. I was working in this project for two years. It's 100,000 square meters. So how does an office like that operate? How, how do you work? How do you get people to work on a project for 10 years? Um, uh, it has fantastic facades made of stone, uh, bronze uh, from Japan, waving colonnades. Um, the, the, the brief of the project was to have a very uh, traditional aspect to it, to be uh, a nice neighbor to the, to the surrounding buildings, and then have a more uh, wow, they describe a wow factor as you got in. So that's why there's, the project is very different from outside and inside. Um, it had natural ventilations through the fins, um, as you know, it, had, uh, uh, it has uh, been labeled as the most sustainable, sustainable building in the world, I think. Um, natural ventilation was one of the factors, and uh, as is other um, uh, uh, things of it. But you go in, and it's a different building, and now you have these waving walls that surround you. You go in through the lift shafts, you go up. Um, and you end up in the pantry where they, uh, you're being welcomed. You're offering, uh, if you're a visitor, you're offered some drinks, some snacks, and you're looking simple, and that was a stop shot. That's why the lobby of this building is in the sixth level rather than the ground floor, because they wanted you to do the journey up, and then here you would have the, the experience. Now, 10 years, huge area, huge uh, footprint, very complex detailing throughout. 100 architects worked on it from start to finish, roughly. Uh, and not only the architects, which you can see here, but also the consultants. There are consultants in this type of project, you have consultants for everything. You have consultants, obviously, planning, quantity surveyors, structure engineers, and there is a constant coordination and communication between the design team and the consultants. Obviously, it depends on what stage, but you're constantly bouncing ideas off them. And every construction Every architectural solution that you find from a design perspective gets checked at some point by someone else. Uh, to, to a ridiculous level, actually, you see down there, it's, there's an or, or, ornithologist. So at some point, when we were designing the facade, someone did a sketch of the, of the pigeon, and that was one of the fun moments of the project, uh, where they put the dimension between the feet of the pigeon and the butt of the pigeon. And he was trying to explain that pigeons don't like to poo on the feet. So there is a certain angle at which you can incline the ledge of the windows and a certain distance that if the uh, bird is not comfortable to sit on, then he would not poo on the bypassers downstairs. So you get, and you really need to put all that feedback into a project. And you get so much information that sometimes it's difficult to do a cohesive design because it's a little like building um, uh, uh, when you have too many ingredients, it, it's, it's difficult to, to, do a nice, to do a nice meal. Sometimes it's easier to simplify. But anyways, nonetheless, uh, uh, this is what happens. And, and, and that's why these buildings work so well. They are machines. Uh, very rarely something goes wrong because they're constantly being scrutinized by, by architects, by people, by engineers, by, by cost consultants, by, by, by all sorts of people. Uh, so again, you have 100 architects. Uh, is it possible to manage a team like that? Well, the building is huge, so you break it in little pieces, and some people will work on the cladding, but the people that work on the cladding might not work on all the cladding. Then you subdivide it. Some people will work on the ground for colonnade. Some people will work on the normal cladding. Some people will work on the roof. Some people will work on the lift. Some people will work on the public realm. And then you have people working in the interiors. And then in the interior, some people work in the atrium, and some people work on the cores. Some people work on the ceilings, some people work on the floor. So you're dissecting the buildings in pieces, and you're dissecting 
obviously the building in stages. And by doing that, you're allocating two or three people a package. So actually, even if you're working in such a big building, you end up working in great detail in a tiny portion. So that is how you can coordinate uh, such a big team, because it's, it's unmanageable by, by a smaller team, particularly in this case. Um, so I was uh, in charge of the atrium at the time. And uh, I always say to everyone, in offices like this, you don't stop designing, which is the fun part of our profession. It works as a battery of options. It's atrium, give me options. And then you give two or three options. A boss says, do this option, do this option. Three bosses, three options, then you do your own. Then they pick one or they don't pick any. And you do another three options and then another three options. So you're constantly designing, constantly drawing plans, constantly doing 3Ds, 3D models, 3D scans, physical models. You have a huge team of people around you that they do the visualizations, they do the models, they do the 3D prints, etc. So it's fantastic. You're always designing. There's nothing with total freedom. You have the budget, you have the resources, you have the team. So that's brilliant. So at the time we were doing eight rooms. Um, and as you can see, it started with a zigzag in eight room, uh, stepping in one direction, solid balustrade, not solid balustrade. And after 100 options, we came up uh, with that option that was the preferred option for a while. And it had an ellipse, ellipse in one direction, morphing to an ellipse in a different direction. And it gave interesting perspectives, top and bottom. But at some point, the, the client said they preferred not to have an open atrium. They preferred to have no possibility of having an accident of, uh, of any sort. And then I had that Eureka moment, three in the morning. You work long hours in these offices. Uh, not necessarily. You choose. Uh, but I had just joined, you're excited, you're in a new city, you're in a big practice. Um, and in that particular case, 3 a.m., I decided to do my own option. Crazy, five in the morning, presentation, and the morning after I decided not to go to the office because I was knackered. And then I received a text from the boss. I thought, oh, I should have gone to the office. They're gonna fire me, I'm still probation. <laughs> the text said the opposite. They said, Ignacio, congratulations. They like your option, which was that one. Option IL at the time, which was my option, is going to be renamed option Norman Foster. And that's how it works. <laughs> many people do many options. Some get chosen, some do not. It's a Foster building at the end of the day. That's how it works. But it's fantastic because they are allowing the younger generation or, 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 the, or, the, or the lower ranks, or however you want to call it, to, to do the design. You're Design is the one that actually ends up being built or not. Uh, but if they pick it, uh, it's a very proud moment. And then the strategy was we had the ellipse, but we didn't want to have a big atrium. So what do we do? We rotate it. We rotate it 120 degrees. And then you end up with spaces that are double height, spaces that are triple height, and spaces um, that are single height. And just in the very center, you have a, a, a common hole that connects them all. It's uh, spatially very rich, it's interesting, it's not been done, it fits the WOW interior, and it, and it gets picked. And this is just the start of the road, because then you do more options. You evaluate widths. Do we want two people to pass, three people to pass? Do we want 17 steps be between the floor plates? Do we want 18? Is it comfortable to go up with this radius? Is it not? What material do we use? And all of that is weeks after weeks of doing models, showing, stainless steel, bronze, so not, soffits, lights, illumination. So again, you, you think you found a solution and then it opens up new topics of design and you go through them and you refine and refine and refine and refine. And you think, oh, we have it, but then you get to do the one-to-one -one models. In this case, we were lucky, there was a big budget and the project was in London, so it was being built. Sometimes in these big offices, you end up in projects that are not in, your, in the same country. So you either have satellite offices that do it, or you'd get to do only the concept design. My opinion is that architecture is to be built. I like the construction stage. I like uh, that aspect of it. So the discussion between the virtual and the, and the real, I think architects, we always pick real and we pick construction. And it's when you get dirty, but it's 
the challenge because every step of the way you need to solve a new problem. Designing can be simple, but taking the design within a budget, within a constraint, in a site, that's what makes the puzzle interesting, I, I think. And then one-to-one -one gets built, and then one-to-one -one gets built in real materials. And then you get to assess the materials, the connections, the joints, the lights, and then finally get into construction. And by that stage, I was no longer in the project. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because as I said, 10 years, very few people that started with us in that project lasted the 10 years. Some people do, uh, but it's not, it's not, it's not that common. Um, so in this case, we were lucky because we got to see up to construction, but of a very detailed stage, to a mock-up, to a real material mock-up. You could argue then you scale it up and that's the real construction. It's not the case. There are many other challenges, and we'll see later. But, but it's, it's, uh, it, was good. it was good for me. And then it opens. Everyone walks through it. It's exactly like the renders, <laughs> or not. But in this case, it was. Uh, eh, again, some people like it, some people not. We had a round, uh, a round edge, and we had a, an intricate ceiling, and we had an intricate ramp, and we had sculptures, and we had. There's a bit of everything in this project, but uh, that means everyone had fun <laughs> to a certain extent. And then uh, there you go, pr proud moment. I visited with my family and you get the tap in the back. Um, and I've shown you all the options that I explored for, for an atrium, but if you're in the facade, you would do the same. You would start with a stone grid, then you would go to a cast glass grid, then you would go to a metal grid, then would go into material changes. The massing also changed along the project. Um, once you pick one, then you're in the, in, the, in the smaller scale models. Once they pick one, you're in the one to three models. Those got built on site, assessing Portland, sandstone, titanium, bronze. Material gets picked. Then you go to the one on one scale. That's cardboard model. But then again, to, to, to get the sense, is it working? Is it not working? And then when it's picked, in this particular case, it went to one one mock up with real materials. So that only happens in these practices maybe with these clients, not even in this office. It's not common to have such a, uh, if you may, uh, engineering approach uh, to, to tweaking all the, all the balls to make sure it works by the time it gets rolled out to a big. Apple, similar project, different country. So design-wise, you're missing, or I was missing the connection with the building. I was missing. Uh, my experience uh, in Bloomberg. But again, the project is huge. Um, you have these curving facades. You have the biggest glass screens manufacturer at the time, 16 meet, 40 or 16 meters long, I think. Um, you have wonderful uh, cafeterias or, or restaurant in the building. That's the fitness center. Again, beautiful uh, part to work in. Visitor center. It has very sexy areas to work in, and I got put in stone package and toilets. <laughs> it can happen in these offices. Not always you get to work on the area of the building that, it's, uh, <laughs> that you're interested in, maybe. But everything has its own challenges, and uh, the stone ended up being exactly like the renders. Everything, again, as, as you might imagine, was uh, tested on, on one to one mock ups, on, on one to three uh, samples. Uh, the color variance of, of the stone is exactly as it was uh, on the specifications. It's an, again another flawless project. Uh, and this was, I'd say, the final project I worked on at Foster. And again, it's in the same direction. It was for a high profile individual's house in, in San Francisco. And it was a Georgian revival property they bought and they wanted to completely renovate it. This really talked to me. It could be a project in London. Um, it is residential. It was a team of four, but it was in San Francisco. But, but to me, the, the, the niceness of, of working, I cannot show pro uh, photos of the finished project for this one because it was highly, highly confidential and there's non-disclosure agreements uh, signed uh, not to disclose any of the details. Those were the pictures of the house when it got bought and uh, publicly available. So anyways, you can see, again, equivalent to a listed building. Uh, art ceilings, moldings, uh, 
protected wisterias uh, in the in the in the in the patios. Um, uh, that that was a planning document, so it can be shown. But it was a th I think four or five story house uh, with libraries, dining rooms, uh, art collection, um, and it was much more um, manageable. You could take care. Whereas in the other projects, you took care of a stone package, or a restroom, or an atrium. In this in this particular case, you saw the entirety of the project. You saw you saw windows. You saw uh, lighting, you saw uh, more of a residential scale, and I did like it very much. So uh, you go to I got to, to see the, the foundry where the materials were actually fabricated. It was again very touchable. Uh, that was the view from the uh, from the penthouse, the, the top shot. So then I left, and that's how an office of uh, one looks like. And you don't have all the support, and you don't have the canteen conversations, and you don't have uh, the bosses that tell you what to do. So you don't have the excuses. You don't have the excuses, I have to work long. You don't have the excuse, I don't like this, but I still have to design it. Now you can handle, or you have to, or, or so you think, because you still have clients, you still have budgets, you still have contractors that you have to be with. Uh, the scale is different. Uh, you start doing your business uh, uh, cards, plaques, etc. And suddenly you have to say you're planning, you're an architect, you're doing project management. But, but, but what does it mean? Because uh, now you've been designing, now you've been coordinating with consultants, now you've been doing the, only the design bit, but you're not doing any contract, contract administration, you're not doing any uh, site surveys, you're not dealing with the fire authorities too much. Uh, you're missing on a lot of work that happens around a project for it to be uh, not only designed but delivered and, and, and constructed. Um, RABA puts it very nicely, but it puts it in stages. So it's strategic, you do the brief in preparation, then in concept, then you add more detail and more detail, then you tender it, then you build it, and then you hand over and then the client is uh, using the building. And that's a very chronological way of understanding a project and a very useful one. Now, these two slides are not visible at all from where we're sitting probably, and they're the most boring slides in the whole show, uh, but it does show the amount of tasks that if you have to do a project on your own, you have to take care of. Because sometimes, um, or most often, uh, for smaller scale projects, you would be the architect, you would be the lead designer, you would be the local architect, you would be the project manager, you would be the contract administrator. You would be all those roles that in bigger practices are being outsourced. Um, now the projects are smaller, so they are more handle, uh, easy to handle, but uh, it, normally we're used to working here. This is the architect and design. You have to design the stairs, the joinery, the landscaping, the schedules, the kitchen, sanitary, etc. And this is the mechanical engineers, the structure, all the all the engineers that that work for a project to happen, fire engineers, etc. This is where we feel comfortable, I think, and this is what you do when you're working in a big practice. Now the earlier slide. This is the project management. This is the the things that you're not that used to, and you don't get exposed when you're in a big practice. And this is to do with. Um, uh, meeting the client originally, doing the brief, uh, getting the project done, um, but then tendering, selecting contractors, assessing their, the, contract, uh, the quotes, um, getting uh, pricing uh, schedules agreed with them. If something goes wrong, uh, who does the, here doing the license to alter with the, with the clients, with the local authorities, the planning applications, some buildings are listed, so you need to ask for listed building consent. Some neighbors, some parties, some, some buildings are sharing party walls with neighbors, so you need party wall awards, etc. The complexity of, 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 of managing a project, when it's actually, it's huge. That's the, and that's the challenge of doing a big project or a nice project. Um, because the details that you think are going to be delivered when you're designing disappear gradually along the way. This is too expensive. Let's do it. This is too complicated. The, the neighbors are not going to allow me. And it's very easy to alter your, your project to a lesser nice uh, thing. 
uh, as you move along the project. Um, but then you're working on your own, so what are the type of things that, that you can... Th these are some of the projects that, that we've been working or that we're working. Small residential, new build, fine. Site extension, London, new... It has some... Uh, it's an extension project, so it has some, some cladding. New, it's nice, interesting. You can do internal renovations, lovely as well. You can do uh, commercial, small commercial. So that is a spa in London, that's a cafe, that's a beauty salon all in London. And same as the projects can be smaller, the role can be different. So for example, for this one, we were only, I was helping the project managers as a, as a checking architect. I was liaising with the client, checking the architect's drawings from a project manager's perspective. So commenting on what the architect's drawings are missing and making sure that gets fixed before it's actually a problem. Here we were lead designers, here we were lead designers, here uh, we were lead designers, but this is the Dubai project, so here we had a local architect. And here we were local architects, so the concept of that store already existed in Madrid, we were just handed a, a concept design and we were just taking care of construction. So even if the projects are retail, so they are fast, you don't need to do the whole spectrum. The fact that you have your own office doesn't mean that you need to do the design and the construction and the project management. You can, but it's also possible that if you don't like one sort of work or the other, you cannot adapt. I think you'll find your way, uh, and the projects are so varied that, that there's always a way uh, to do a nice project. I'll show you a few. Uh, how to pitch to new clients, so that was a house that we were living in, and uh, we convinced our landlord to renovate the house. Uh, so that's a way into getting your own projects if you don't know how to start uh, your own practice. And uh, that was the before, and that was the after. And it's a little internal renovation, huge complexity because, again, London is a leasehold property. You, you need uh, acoustic tests with the neighbours, you need uh, legal licence to alter the grid with the neighbours. Uh, there's, there's always complications in order to deliver a project. Uh, and therefore, a small project can learn you, can help you learn those stepping stones in order not to make mistakes in the next project. Uh, and those are some of the, of the final images. This was an extension in London. Again, uh, as you, from interior renovation, you go to extension and it comes with its own complexities and you have build over agreements because the pipes are going under and you have party wall agreements because you're sharing a wall with a neighbor and you have other sorts of complexities that if you're doing little by little projects, you, you will you learn how to, how to handle because uh, there are many and it's complicated. Um, and again, the before and the after, which you're hopefully proud uh, at the end of the day uh, with a finished project. Um, I think uh, we, had a, we had a CPD before uh, tonight and it was based on cladding and, and glazing. So this probably was part of the material of, of CPD we saw before. Um, interior renovation uh, in London, different clients. Uh, this was a huge complex project because uh, Victorian buildings always come with problems. So you start a demolition and then it had no insulation. Uh oh. So then you need to talk to the local authorities. Building control. How do you solve it? What's the risk of condensation? What's not? Then we had uh, dry rot. Uh-oh. So then there's pest control. There's extra checks. Uh, there was an old uh, hive over there. So again, working in renovation uh, would bring many projects, many problems that you were not anticipating and, uh, and, and, and that need to be taken care of. Uh, coordinating with the joiners, um, and again, the scale of the domestic scale, the standard details, etc. Uh, bathrooms, commercial. Commercial is a little bit different because commercial requires tighter deadlines. Uh, if you don't open a shop by a certain day, they miss a collection, they miss a sales. Uh, so every time we do commercial, we try to surround ourselves with bigger teams. In this case, we had project managers. We we're only acting as, as local architects. We think it's safer in commercial environment to have more help of, or, or, or more consultants around you. Um, this was shop in, in, in London, Sloan Avenue. 
every detail, every shelf uh, gets a bit in the foster fashion, templated, uh, tried, mocked up, because you're working for a client uh, that's a company. Uh, too tight at deadlines. Um, building, as I said, is not easy. You need we were, we were specifying big pieces of glass, we were specifying complex stairs, balustrades, uh, tight connections to, to marble. Uh, those are, those, that's the mock-up for the floating um, uh, shelves. So some were done in, in plywood, some were done in plaster, some were done. Trying to, to minimize uh, uh, dodgy details again, because the end product is the build project. Uh, so whatever you design needs to, needs to be followed up by how you build it and needs to be followed up uh, by a nice uh, product at the end, obviously. This was same client. They were happy with the shop in London. They argued with the, local, with the, with the lead designers at the time for other projects, so they hired us to, to be the lead architects for the shop in Dubai. As I said before, we contacted a friend in Dubai and um, uh, the details were already sorted. So this is... Um, applying the same knowledge that you've already got in one shop uh, to a different site. Um, nice handrail details. I think some of you are working on, on fashion project uh, this term. Uh, <laughs> I suppose different type of project, but uh, fashion is interesting. Um, the concept, they were selling uh, wedding dresses and the concept was lovely because the girl that would go to buy the dress would go in through one door and the dressing room would have no mirrors. They want her to get dressed without seeing how she looked with, with, with all the pieces and the, and the ties. And she would get out through another door and there would still be no mirrors and she would have a family there sitting. So the first reaction that she sees when she gets out of the room is the people, wow, and the smile. And then her perception of herself changes and then she walks two steps and then she turns around and then there's a mirror and how theatrical that, that, that tour is around. Uh, it's probably uh, interesting for, for a fashion concept. Uh, uh, this was a beauty salon. Um, I suppose something interesting also to say is how important it is to work with the trades. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to share a project or you need to work in collaboration with many teams. And most often than not, it will be a joinery or a carpenter. And whether a project ends up looking good or not, uh, it's not only the architect, of course, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge team, uh, the contractor and, uh, and the engineers and the joiners, and it's important to, um, to work well with everyone. That was their original uh, beauty salon. Uh, we didn't know how a beauty salon worked. We met them. They explained all they wanted. They explained how they worked. Nothing was really working in our heads, except they said, this is the only piece of furniture that we like in our salon. And we said, okay, well, uh, you're gonna get a lot of that. And, uh, <laughs> and they were happy. <laughs> and sometimes you need to pull the thread because you don't know where to start a project and you don't know anything about a client. And, 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 and there's always something that you need to anchor yourself. Um, <laughs> and she was very happy. Um, and she gave us another project. She gave us a, uh, a cafe, and I'll, I'll show some drawings of the, of the cafe later. Um, and there's a visiting the, visiting the, uh, the joinery. And the final project I'm gonna show is Aire. This is a, a spa in London, like I said. We, we've discussed scale of projects, we've discussed scale of teams, we've discussed uh, budgets, we've discussed uh, scope of services. And within the scope of services, um, like I said, you can adjust. Uh, here we were helping the, the project managers, so we had no deliverables. It was for a spy in London in a building actually where Peter Pan was written. Uh, so that was lovely. Uh, few stories, spa. Um, the building was a class two listed building and, and, and the client wanted to, to preserve all, all the roughness. So actually all the walls are leaving the existing splaster, the, the, the studs visible and all the swimming pool downstairs are, are showing exposed uh, brick wall, which again, huge challenge to coordinate because uh, it, they were used as side offices, so they were pinning things on the walls. If you don't want to 
have exposed services on those walls, you need to run them through the back because it's a listed building. You can only touch finishes, you can only touch cornices, skirtings. Uh, it's, it's a complex project that at the end looks like it's not complex, but I, I think that's the beauty of a, of a project. When it looks natural and nothing is out of place, it means you've done a good job at hiding services and, and, and doing as, as good as you can. And these are the swimming pools downstairs uh, with the, obviously, uh, uh, vaulted ceiling that, that it had. Uh, that, as simple as it looks, is not at all. You still need to excavate, you still need to put the reinforcement bars, you still need to integrate all the piping of the pools uh, within the walls, and, um, and hopefully at the end, uh, you don't get any of this visible. Um, now, a, a very quick uh, brush through a lot of images, um, but I was asking uh, Augustas if it would be helpful to, to show you actually the set of drawings that goes with these projects, just so that you uh, get an understanding of the material that the architect is producing as a design. And as I said, it, it needs to go with all the construction uh, uh, supervision. But that was for the cafe. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll freak through it very quickly. Renders. And after all of that, if you don't see sockets, switches, lights, and things like that everywhere, you've succeeded. And uh, <laughs> those were the pictures at the very end. Uh, we didn't have that project professionally photographed, so that's why I didn't include it in the presentation. But th those were taken by the client. Uh, and it's actually very similar to our original uh, intent. So again, uh, happy, pro happy project, happy client, um, happy contractor, um, and hope you enjoy it. <laughs> long. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Hopefully, uh, I mean, I, I, probably I talk too much, but uh, I tried to explain as well as I could all the different things that you can face uh, after uni. Yeah, uh, Augustus. Um, I suppose you have to say you like all of them and every project, uh, every type of project, every scale of project uh, has uh, the, the design aspect to it. Doesn't matter if it's a house, doesn't matter if it's a chair, doesn't matter. And, and we enjoy designing, I suppose that's why we're all here. Now that being said, um, I, I do like residential a lot. Uh, but the residential client is more complicated. Ultimately, it's their house. Uh, so they tend to have a stronger opinion of what they want and what they don't want. And at this particular stage of our careers, we, uh, uh, we obviously need to deliver what the client wants. Uh, it's not that we have a very definite style and then the clients pick us for what we do, but it's, it's adapting and, and adjusting to the client. So in that sense, I would say commercial projects are a bit easier because you're working for a company. So uh, there's not such strong brief, I would say, and you're more flexible. And they're fast paced and you have consultants uh, around you. And I think that communication and that sharing the load and sharing, I think that's uh, for us at least, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice compromise between the big humongous uh, headquarters and the, and the smaller uh, residential projects. Um, I know you kind of alluded to kind of what we explicitly said, uh, sort of suggested that um, working in a large practice is probably the best way to kind of go, I guess, to start off with and then you kind of get your feet and stuff like that. But um, how do you feel, um, given your kind of very kind of educational um, background, how do you feel your education has set you up towards working in, in practice, either large or small, has it, has it favoured either one? So um, I think I would recommend to work for a large practice uh, after you finish your education. Uh, during my studies, the offices that I did internships in were medium to small, apart from KPF. Uh, 
so another uh, elephant, obviously. But, uh, and I liked, uh, and I think that's also important. Uh, so, so when you get out of uni, you've, you've seen uh, a bit of everything. At least, I mean, one summer, one month. It's not that, uh, but, but you got the taste. Uh, then when you finish, large practices give you a lot of freedom to design and to get exposed to many projects in a short amount of time and, um, and varied. I mean, I had headquarters, but I also had residential, so, so, so it, does, it doesn't go to say that you're only going to be designing museums. Uh, but, but I think, but I think it, it, it helps to, to, to do a transition. If you start on your own too quick, I think you miss a little bit on, on those projects, and, and it's easier to do them earlier in your career than later, I think. So that gives you a broader perspective faster, maybe. Uh, in one of the more recent drawings you showed, uh, you had a lot, of, a lot of dimensions in the plan. How did you get those numbers to be like nice and round? <laughs> and, uh, does it, and when you actually end up building the thing, does it actually end up being, I don't know, say, exactly one meter? Um, depends on your personality, I suppose. I have a bit of <laughs> uh, talk. So I, I do like to do things to uh, more or less multiples of five. Uh, I think it simplifies uh, the dimension and the number that needs to be drawn on site. Obviously, no dimension on site is the same as, the, as per the drawing. You need to adjust on site all the time. You need to uh, draw it and template it on site. And then you need to adjust the drawings to show what's on. So, so it's a back and forward all the time. But I think the, the cleaner the drawings, the less chances of a mistake during the construction phase. Uh, and you feel uh, and you feel better, I suppose, <laughs> if the drawing is neat. Uh, and the mentions are very important because uh, happened to us one one dimension was to the to the end. Uh, there were two dimensions overlapping, and then it got built wrong. Um, the only things that the builders would look at that number. The scale is useful, and the CAD no one will have. So they will build, at least nowadays, they will build with a print. So, so dimensions and tagging is, is, is what's going to uh, guarantee a success or a failure <laughs> on site. Uh, if any, which aspects of working for a large firm do you miss? Um, the amount of time drawing and designing and modeling. I think the happiest moment is when you sit down and you put your headphones or whatever it is that you, how do you like to draw, and you spend uh, five hours in un, uh, uninterrupted working out a concept, uh, a plan, a layout, uh, something. Like when you are working in a small practice and you need to take projects to construction, there's a lot of coordination, a lot of emails. Um, and actually in a large practice, you design a lot when you join and when you're uh, an architect or an associate. As you go up the ladder and you become an associate partner and a partner, you, they tend to have their emails as opposed to the CAD or MicroStation or, or whatever it is. They don't model, they don't draw, they sketch, um, and, uh, and maybe that's good enough. Um, but they don't, they don't spend time working the details as much as uh, as you would do. Uh, and, and I think that's the nicest part of our profession, really, the design, the design bit. And many people say, why don't you grow the office and you hire someone? And of course I would, and of course I will. And when we get the right project, we will do so. But then I fear that I will give what I want, uh, which is the time to draw. And if you hire someone to do the project admin, then you need maybe to hire him at your level, and then you enter in a partnership, and then that's a different conversation altogether, um, and I think it would be some, uh, strange to hire someone above me to coordinate me, but I would like to actually, because I would like to keep on drawing, <laughs> so I suppose. Uh, you, uh, you have to enjoy it while you can, because uh, the time you invest in designing and drawing is, is less and less and less as, as the project gets more comp complex, I think.
everything, I think. Because uh, you think you know, because you think you can design, and you, and you think you can coordinate with other contractors, and you think you can build joinery and, and, and design furniture because you've done it. Uh, and it is the most important part of a project, because if it doesn't, the, the starting design doesn't look good, then it doesn't matter how good you build it, it's still not going to look good. So the priority is still the design. Um, but I think I tried to put it more or less chronologically. I think we did well in, in, in that we started simple and then we learned from our mistakes, but they were not big because there was... So I, we, we didn't try to uh, get... Or, or, we, or we didn't get too complex project from the start. So actually it's been quite gradual and, and you get to know. Uh, and, and if you learn from the things that you, you're you're being challenged with along the way, then every time it gets more complex, every time. Thank you very much. I had a question. Huh? Uh, so I find, I find the before and after photographs that you've shown are most interesting, like say the nail bar. Do you ever walk into a space and you find it such a mess you, you basically lose hope. You know, you're like, it's so bad. You know? And it's amazing how you manage, actually, it must be one of your particular skills, I think, to have turned that nail bar from the. Well, I mean, the, it wasn't the most pleasing, let's, let's say. Yeah. And then you've turned it into an absolutely. You've elevated the business, to be Obviously, yes. I mean, the most important thing is to listen to the client, obviously, and uh, they have a vision, and, 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 and you have to work with the client. Hopefully seduce him, uh, convince him that your ideas are, are, are what's going to make their life, their house, their business better. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, with that same client, we repeated and we did the cafe, our first concept for the cafe. I was having a, it was not that one, it was a, they told me they were from South Africa and it was all in, in bare brick, super minimal. And um, as I was talking through them, the husband was nodding and smiling and I was thinking, I've nailed it. And then the presentation finished and the wife looked at him and said, no way. <laughs> so, uh, so it goes both ways, but anyways, uh, the, 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 the Encarnitas house, so the, the new built house you saw in dark timber, that was, she had a cabin as in her Pinterest. Now everyone shares their Pinterest and designing becomes more complicated because you have to try and integrate the best images of the best of a Pinterest of 1000 images completely disconnected. Um, but she had a cabin that was in black and uh, she, like Japan and so charred timber and burnt timber became the motto and she loved it and uh, so anyways you have to read the client uh, the brief the project and and hopefully you convince them that you convince them of something good Um, yes, now Foster has more resources. So with Foster, the models are super important and you have a model shop and they do beautiful models. Um, uh, now, obviously, we try with the project. Number one, the project needs to sell it. If not, uh, obviously, the renders and the 3Ds help. Most clients don't understand or don't know how to read drawings that well, so you need to help them through it. Uh, and then 3Ds worked, renders work, mood boards work, maybe even better than renders. Like uh, when you show a, 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 a template or a, a board with tiles and, and, and wood floors, and they, they tend to like it. Everyone likes the tactile part of it. 
the renders they would probably criticize. The sofa is white, why white? It's like, because it's a render and you can put the color sofa that you prefer. But uh, <laughs> so I, I think tactile things and uh, uh, 3Ds, we tried to simplify actually. I, saw, I, show, I showed a lot of renders, but the renders are already of the, of the finished project uh, or, the, or the final image. Along the way, we do simplified hidden lines and colored and, and uh, um, and, and more simple, simple 3Ds, and that really helps. And they don't have the, the material in their head, and, and they don't look real, so they don't get confused with the fact that they don't like the basin or the sink. Or, uh, so abstract, I think, still uh, abstract and materials, probably in my, in my opinion. And virtual reality and, and Thank you.